For those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet, I'm Heather Farrell. I'm the curator and director of exhibitions here at BCA Center, Burlington City Arts. And I am delighted that you have been able to join us both physically and virtually for tonight's program with our special guest speaker and artist, James Buck. James has just recently returned from assignment with Project Hope, where he has been covering the perilous conditions of healthcare workers and patients and the general Ukrainian population amidst the war in Ukraine. This is really a phenomenal opportunity to share their stories tonight. And I just like to extend a few thank yous before I begin uh, my introduction. I'd like to thank uh, Milton Rosa Ortiz, our BCA advisory board member for connecting us with James as he had just returned from his assignment in Vermont a mere days before he connected us. I'd also like to thank the organizations that make these types of programs possible at BCA, including the New England Foundation for the Arts through the New England Arts Resilience Fund, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Vermont Arts Council, and also our wonderful team here at BCA, our events and communications team, really to make this program possible tonight in its hybrid format and to get it out into the community. So thank you. Before I begin, I'd like to share a few notes on our format because it is hybrid. After my introductions, uh, James will begin his talk sharing images and stories of the people he encountered while in Ukraine and Poland. And then following the presentation, we will open up for questions from both our audience here at BCA as well as on Zoom. If you are on Zoom, please be sure to uh, pose a question in the Q&A feature and a reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and we will be posting it without, well, probably within the next week on our BCA uh, YouTube channel. So with that, I'd love to share a brief bio of James, who we're so happy to have here tonight. Uh, James Buck is a humanitarian photojournalist who works to humanize global crises by connecting people through the power of visual storytelling. He works for news and NGOs, and he's responding to unfolding disasters, revealing the hidden tales of strength and suffering to help people understand and care about their global neighbors. His passion is creating connection and inspiring action by meeting people around the world and bringing their stories home. Born in India, James grew up in Saudi Arabia and he began photographing the uprisings that led, led to the Arab Spring as a graduate journalism student at UC Berkeley where he received his MJ and MA in journalism and Middle Eastern studies in 2010. In 2008, he was arrested by Egyptian authorities attempting to repress the outside coverage of a revolt within Cairo, a catalyzing event that spurred James to work on untold stories from a compassionate point of view. Describing himself as a trans man in recovery, Buck brings multiple lenses to his work as he invites viewers through his powerful imagery to experience other people's lives. We are very pleased here at BCA to welcome James Buck for tonight's program. Thank you so much. I'm James and it's so nice to see you all here in person and online. And um, you know, I'm really honored to be here and uh, this is a really fancy thing for me to do an artist talk, right? This is um, not a way I typically think of myself. And as I started to prepare for this, I thought, well, wow, this is, this is this great honor. I'm gonna get to talk to people and share my work. And I also felt this weird feeling that was sort of guilty um, because 
what my job is, is really to be a witness and not to make an image that's about me or something cool that I found or to tell any story. I mean, hopefully you know, I'm not famous enough. Nobody here came because they wanted to hear something from James Buck, right? Nobody was like, oh, that guy, um, which is awesome. People came here because you care about what's happening in Ukraine. And that's really what is important. And what I hope, um, what hope, hopefully that's what I can transmit to you. It's just what I saw and, and what, what, um, what happened in front of me. And hopefully that will mean something to you. It's a strange job that I have because <laughs> photojournalists like I am are sort of attracted like flies to suffering. Um, there's a Facebook group I belong to that jokingly calls ourselves the Vulture Club um, after the, the famous uh, photograph of the, um, the, the starving um, young boy in, in Sudan because there is this weird, this weirdness about chasing after disasters, but it's also really important to tell these stories. And it's something that I struggle with all the time. When do I take an image? When do I stop and help? When does this photograph communicate something that's important? When am I potentially dehumanizing or harming someone that I'm interacting with? So those are questions I don't have answers to, but I will invite you to consider that and certainly give me your feedback um, as I show you some of this work. So I'm going to show you that the thing that I sort of meditate on before I do any, uh, any photography always is this concept of awakening. And I always ask to serve awakening, whatever that means. So um, I hope that's what, that's what we'll serve here tonight. So that said, I'll start in Poland. Uh, I work as uh, a photographer, I work locally for seven days um, and I shoot a lot of drag shows. Uh, I do a lot of stuff like that. And I also sometimes go places in the world where there are wars and um, major epidemics. And weirdly, both things are important equally in, in a lot of ways. When this war broke out, I have alerts on my phone set up. I know when stuff is happening and when our Project Hope is an organization I work for often and when our emergency response director, Tom Cotter, starts tweeting about some event, I know I'm probably gonna get deployed or might get deployed. And so I got 48 hour notice that I'm probably gonna get deployed to Poland and maybe it's gonna be Romania, maybe it's Poland, maybe it's Moldova, maybe we don't know where it's gonna be. And uh, it ended up being Krakow. And I got to Krakow and I've, I've photographed a lot of refugee situations before. I've photographed the Syrian refugee diaspora quite a bit in Jordan and in Turkey. And I've never photographed a refugee situation in Europe. And refugee situations should be considered equal everywhere in the world, right? No one person's suffering is more important or different from anyone else's, but there's something really that hits home and is just cripplingly frightening about seeing hundreds of thousands of people who look exactly like you pouring out of a country on buses, clutching suitcases. And that's what I saw when I got to Krakow. Um, the first day we were at a transit station, basically the team I was with was a logistics team. They were trying to set up uh, the ability to supply, to, to send medical supplies into Poland. Uh, excuse me, into Ukraine from Poland. And I'm the only photographer among all these logisticians and emergency responders. So I'm sort of a little barnacle on their team trying to photograph, capture what they're doing um, and hopefully bring it home to the team and, and, to, and to news outlets as well. One of the challenges of doing this type of photography, as I said, is that I'm right there in people's faces when they're at the worst moment in their lives, when they're really suffering. And I immediately saw people sort of streaming, streaming off of buses and this huge, it was a crazy place. It was actually what looked like it had been a customs mall. One of those places where there are like lots of perfume and those giant Toblerone bars and a bunch of, cause I eventually figured this out. I couldn't figure out what kind of place we were in, but it seemed that these makeshift centers had been set up to accommodate the huge numbers of people that were coming in and people were actually being sort of housed in the, these little, um, what had been these duty-free shops, it seems. So this is, um, we're east from Krakow, near one of the 
border stations near um, Ukraine. And I'm trying to get the sort of lie of the land and what what's happening and not be too much in people's faces, not be overly intrusive. And I worry a lot about authorities as well because I have been arrested. Um, and so the first day I'm trying to just orient myself to what's happening. And what's happening is that people and their pets and their kids are just showing up in these huge numbers. Um, and they're coming in on these buses, just one after the other. Like imagine, you know, Penn Station, there's just these huge buses coming in from wherever they're coming in. And people are just unloading from the buses, coming into the transit station. And the people who are responding locally are Polish, are local Polish uh, firefighters. These weren't federal authorities. This wasn't the UN. Um, uh, High Commission on Refugees, who are usually there at refugee camps. There's, at this point anyway, I couldn't speak to today, but there wasn't that level of international organization. This was sort of a goodwill of the local fire department out here unloading bags, and it's very cold. Um, I know we live in Vermont, and but uh, it's this is this is cold. And so they're unloading bags and just bringing people into this um, sort of station to be sort of processed. And I noticed right away that there wasn't, again, that infrastructure that there often is where people are, people's IDs are kind of being checked or numbers are being taken down or some kind of registry of where people are coming from or where people are going. Instead, what's happening is people are just standing in lines trying to find buses to various places in Europe. So there might be one coming in to Lisbon, maybe there's something going to Paris, maybe there's something going to Warsaw, and people are just trying to figure out where they can go, how they can get out of where they are, and sort of lining up for hours in the cold. And it's very difficult. Um, it's difficult to witness, it's difficult to try to photograph, and I always feel like a creep um, because <sighs> I'm the only guy there with a camera. I'm the only person there who's not really helping anybody. I'm sort of taking something from the situation instead of giving something to people. And, and that doesn't really feel very good, but I try to interact with people the, the most respectfully I can. And I noticed that the Polish authorities were really helping. They weren't, they weren't averse to cameras. That's my big fear is first I do sort of a limit, like a, just a test with the camera, um, sort of bringing it out, just seeing how people respond to it. What, what happens when I even get it out? Because some places in the world, as soon as I take the camera out, stuff starts really going off. And here people weren't responding to it too much. Um, so I was able to sort of capture the scene and what was happening, which was mostly just people at this point really cooperating with each other and really trying to help each other get, get somewhere. And I, I had a lot of, I was glad to see that level of cooperation. And I also know from experience, I couldn't say for sure about this situation, but typically refugee situations tend to strain local populations after a period of time, goodwill can change. And I had this sense like, this is great that there's this level of cooperation right now, but I know, gosh, this is gonna be hard if this situation continues at this volume. Um, I wasn't allowed to photograph inside the shelter, but I sneaked a few iPhone photos which is always a little iffy, but I wanted to get a sense of just what it looked like. So you can see the kind of sleeping conditions and the close quarters that people are sort of stuffed in with their bags together. There was a sign I had to take a picture of because it's in Poland for Ukrainians in English. And it's like, are you fleeing your country? Go to this website. You know, I, I, I just sort of couldn't believe it. You know, it's, it's helpful. I mean, it's, it's, it's helpful. But um, that's that's sort of what what you're being met with as a resource. And I'm seeing stuff like this, which again is an iPhone photo from the hip, but I thought this was important to show because I don't know this woman's story, but what you can see here as an example that she's looking for a place in Germany for herself and her two kids. And I started to think immediately about the risks of trafficking because you've got a vulnerable population. It's mostly women and children who are fleeing. I'll talk about that in a minute. And people are just trying desperately to get anywhere. And I started thinking about assignments I've done on sex trafficking in Eastern Europe, where people are being promised like work in this place, but then they take your passport and stuff like that. I thought, oh God, the UN really needs to get in here and, and kind of you know keep an eye on things. Um, 
I went outside and this is what I do when I, this is what I do, this is what keeps me going, is I just play with kids a lot of the time. And uh, now with my camera, I can flip the screen around, you know, I can show the kid his, their photo and I say, look, oh my God, it's you, it's you. And then the kid's like, oh my God. And it doesn't, every language, every country in the world, this game works, you know, the kid, kids love it. Um, every now and then I'll get somebody who doesn't love it. But this, you know, I spent maybe three, and it's one of the few things I can do sometimes really is just to give people a little bit of a human interaction. Sometimes I can be a therapist, I can listen. Sometimes I can just, play with the kids from it. I try as hard as I can to give people a positive experience of me, even in those few moments. And I played with this kid for a while. His mom, I don't think was too impressed, but uh, we had a moment and I put my hand up and he put his hand up and we hung out and then the bus pulled away and I don't know where they went. Um, we went to another one of these stations and saw a really similar set of a really similar scenario where we saw people being fed, given sort of basic um, basic needs being met at the scene, um, people bringing their pets and carriers, every belonging that they had on their back, huddled out in the cold and just waiting for buses, trying to figure out where to go. Um, people of all ages trying to bring their families somewhere. This woman here I met and I spoke to for a while. I often do this um, when I'm, especially when I'm doing this work alongside emergency responders, I don't tend to have a, a reporter of any kind with me. So I'm the, I'm the only person and I, my Ukrainian is, you know, I don't have any. So uh, Google Translate app is, I'll put some basic explanations of what I'm doing and some very basic questions and I'll just record people in their native language and I'll try to send it home and translate. But I find that a lot of times people, even though they know I can't understand their language, they just, like they really have this urgency to get their story out there. And some of the best interactions I've ever had have been just using like a Google Translate app and people have just said, thank you for listening to my story. So this woman, um, pseudonym that for everybody is Anna. Um, she said that she, she told me the story, which I got later translated. I mean, she's just pouring out the story to me in Ukrainian and I'm going, uh-huh, uh-huh, you know, and I'm making, you know, I'm, I'm like doing the body language that I can't because she's so um, emotional. I'm trying to, to be there for her as best I can while also taking the photo and also trying to record the story that I don't understand, but I can, I know what she's telling me without, without knowing what she's telling me. And, and later I heard that she said, um, she said life uh, was really traumatic. Air raid sirens rang out day and night. She was unable to sleep. She kept sheltering in basements and she had a panic attack after days of intense stress. Now she's fled to Poland and she's boarded a bus for a town in Europe that she had never heard of before. She said, it's so hard to live like this. I left my home and my job and came here. I fear my house will be destroyed and the buildings in our town will be demolished. I wanna go back because Ukraine is my home. I dream that we will be told the war is over. I want it so much. And uh, I spent some time with her family. And what ends up happening inevitably in these situations, these are some of my team members, uh, there's nothing we can do. So we just help whatever we can. We start lo loading bags onto buses and we got on a, uh, onto a bus. These are some of the guys I've responded to in many situations around the world with. And I actually, I don't even know where that bus is. I can't, my Cyrillic isn't very good. Bro, I don't know where that bus is going. Maybe someone who reads Cyrillic can read it, but that was Anna, that was the last I saw of her and she was gone. Um, back in Krakow, we went to the Children's Hospital uh, where Project Hope has, supports a pediatric wing. And this is a pediatric oncology center and there are two photos, there's two stories I can tell in every situation. And one of them is this story where I come in and I interact with the kids and I play with them for a minute and we do this stuff. You know, the kids are really happy to see us. We maybe bring them some toys or supplies. This is my colleague, Vlatko, who after this interaction, we went down to the gift shop and bought all these toys for the kids because we just really wanted to give them something, you know? And then there's this photo, which is also true. Um, this, uh, this boy, Dimitri, 10 years old, when the conflict began in Ukraine, he was preparing for his 10th round of chemotherapy in Kyiv. Uh, his mother knew that she needed to act fast. She said the decision to come to Poland was sudden. We knew that the child's treatment had to be continued and we had no idea where to go. They fled the country, she said, amid huge traffic jams. It was almost impossible to drive. We were afraid someone would drop a bomb. 
our children managed to fall asleep and I sat and prayed all the way. Now they do, they are receiving uh, cancer treatment at the Krakow Children's Hospital, but they're worried about their relatives back in Ukraine and they do like a daily roll call to see that everyone is still okay. And um, she said, the Polish are so kind and help us a lot. Local people are so compassionate. We're grateful for this help, for the opportunity to treat our child and live here. What we do want is to return to Ukraine because there is our home, our family, our parents, our roots. And I share that quote with you because I've met refugees in many countries, in many places, and I've said this before for people who've heard me talk before, but I've never once heard someone say, I really want to go to America and drink Coke and get wear Nikes. This weird myth we have that people, they, they, whoever they are, all want to come to our countries, right? But refugees want us to go home universally. And um, that tends to be the best support we can provide. Not that resettlement isn't great, and it is really important as well, but I've never met someone who said, I'm so glad I fled my country in this war so that I could come to America. Um, that's, not been a, that's not been an experience that I've had anyway. So I spent some time in the, in the cancer ward with the kids that started getting their chemo treatments, which was really sweet. They were a lot of fun. And uh, this little girl was showing me a picture of what her last birthday party in, back in Ukraine before, uh, before the, the treatments began. And I heard a lot of stories uh, from these folks, which were great. And I happened to just walk by this, take some photos of this one little thing that was happening, uh, this exchange of sutures. The team was working super hard to get this logistics supply going into, into Ukraine. And there was this, for some reason, this, this box of sutures was really important. I had no idea why at the time, but they'll come back into the story. Um, another day I spent at the train station in Krakow. My team was off doing some logistics and at this point they kind of trust me enough to just say, James, go do whatever, uh, which is great and terrifying because I don't have the language. And again, I just feel like a vulture. Like I walk into the train station in Krakow, which has been become this sort of transit center, right? People are sleeping everywhere. Uh, there are just people pouring in from all over into, into this sort of central holding station, really, and then looking for places to go. And I spent the first hour um, sort of just walking around nervously trying to take pictures. And it's really important. One thing that I try to do, especially working for NGOs, is not to photograph people's faces because the images, when I'm working for a... Um, a nonprofit organization is opposed to for the news, the images could be used for promotion and fundraising. And even though it's a nonprofit, they are still image licensing and they want to be really sensitive around not using people's faces and pe giving people dignity and giving people the right to be, to decline the right to be, photog to be photographed or to be used in a campaign. You wouldn't want your photo taken, you know, when you're at a bus station and then see it in a big billboard somewhere, uh, you know, saying, feed these hungry, you know, Vermonters, look at this poor guy sitting on the, you know, Cherry Street bus station, you know. So it's really important to try not to show faces as much as I can without, unless I get permission, which I often do, but it makes my job so hard because I have to, first of all, faces are how we connect to other humans, right? We know that even like when we, you know, when we do experiments with young children or other primates, like facial expression is such a big deal and how we feel and express and care about each other. But also it's just really hard. And I had to spend a lot of time standing there waiting for someone's leg to go into the way into the frame or some way to get around depicting the face, but still hopefully capture some of um, some of the sentiment. So spending a bunch of time in the train station in Krakow, trying to figure out what's happening. I think after the first hour or so, I just went outside and cried for a long time, um, which is usually really a good thing. That's usually a turning point for me. I kind of need to do that. And I said, okay, I've got to start talking to people. How am I going to talk to people? I don't speak the language. I don't have a translator. I don't have anybody with me. It's just me. And what I noticed was that people were posting on this message board. You can see again, it's like, <laughs> you know, two people for this town, or I can host people in this city or what have you. And I guess the place of the day was Vienna. And so a lot of people were trying to find people to meet up with in Vienna. I guess the, the EU government maybe was running extra trains and there was a train coming to Vienna that day. So people were running all around this message board trying to find places to go. Um, I noticed, I started noticing these volunteers in this, again, trying to crop people's faces, which is really, but but get the interaction, which is hard. I noticed these volunteers in these yellow jackets, and um, I was 
I realize this one actually says staff in English, but this one I read in Cyrillic. I was like, vol my volunteer, volunteer. Okay, I get it, I get it. But I guess you can kind of tell by the yellow jackets. They're doing some kind of volunteer work. They're handing stuff out. And I figure, okay, these are the people who maybe I can connect with who can help me to talk to this population. And at this train station, I guess it was the local uh, scouting organization. Uh, you can see by the patches on the person's uh, jersey there. Uh, it was a scouting organization that had organized this sort of resource gathering and drop. And there were some Americans there, there were Polish uh, people, there were just people all from all over. They were gathered together and just handing out whatever uh, resources they were available, food, hygiene kits, et cetera. I, I, I started hanging out with this one guy because I could hear that he was speaking Ukrainian. I could kind of tell. He had this Ukraine scarf on, but he was Polish. And I saw these Polish kids come in and just, they were, they were bringing in like bagged sandwiches. He just was walking around with this box, handing out whatever people would give him. So people, these kids, these teenagers came in, you can see this lunch container full of sandwiches. And that's what the vibe was like at, at this point in time anyway. People were bringing in like sandwiches from home or from a deli and giving them to volunteers who were there. And the volunteers were just going around and distributing them to people. That's the kind of, the level of help that was happening at that time. Um, I asked him basically if he would come and help me translate and because he seemed to speak Ukrainian and he did. He found me a Ukrainian refugee, a young woman who didn't want to be photographed, a 20 year old woman who was the only person supporting her family because she worked remotely. So while her family was fleeing, she could keep her job and she translated two interviews for me, which was great and horrific because I was using this traumatized person to tell these stories from these other traumatized people. And after she translated two stories for me, she kind of was like, I, I kind of had it. I gotta, um, I've gotta stop. And that was, that's okay. Uh, but I really appreciated that she did that. I met some, I met more families, people who live close to the nuclear reactor and really feared uh, like uh, terrorist activity or, or uh, that the war would, that someone was gonna hit the reactor. These people said they lived about seven kilometers from a nuclear facility and they were really worried that there was gonna be an attack at the nuclear facility. And so they fled together. And I started realizing at this point, the reason I'm seeing all women and children and I started asking you about it is that um, Ukraine has a, a mandatory military conscription and men aren't allowed to leave the country. And men of a certain age aren't allowed to leave the country because of that mandatory military service. So women and children are tending to leave on their own. And a lot of people started telling me stories about having left behind their father, their brother. Um, it was really sad. So I spent the day in this train station in Krakow and I saw these folks wait for train after train coming in. And my U Polish is no better than the Ukrainian refugees Polish. So none of us knew which of the train to Vienna was, but eventually uh, we figured it out after many hours of waiting and they, the train to Vienna came. The people I had been helping with their bags for a few hours and talking to boarded up for Vienna and I never saw them again. <sighs> I do, I do always though give them my, my number and tell them to get in touch if they need something. Sometimes people do later. So the last story I'm gonna share with you is about the sutures. So you can sort of see my colleagues up in the top right corner there. A couple of days later, I find out that we're gonna get into Lviv. We're gonna get across the border into Ukraine. And I don't even know what we're bringing with us because I'm worried about cameras. Getting cameras across any border, let me tell you the one thing you do not wanna bring across a border is cameras. Just nobody likes journalists. I, they really don't, like, and depending on the situation, when you come in and you look like you're about to tell some kind of visual story, it just makes governments uncomfortable. It doesn't, they don't like it. So it's not always true, but it's often true. And I've had a lot of trouble with this. I was nervous about getting into Ukraine with my cameras and my drone. And I'm thinking like, I'm gonna get arrested at the border and you know this often happens to me. So I'm paying no attention to what my colleagues are bringing in, but they get there and we get to this hospital in the middle of the night after we hitchhiked with a Ukrainian woman who got us across the border because she was friends with the border guards. And there's this, this box, this box that they're carrying around and they're so excited that they brought this box in. And I meet Dr. Igor on the right, who's just beaming from ear to ear because we brought this box of this box in and they start unboxing these sutures. And it turns out what they are is a special thin filament cardiac sutures that are used for heart transplants. And we have just brought them across the border to Ukraine's 
premier transplant facility, the first hospital in the country to successfully perform a lung transplant, which they were so proud of, which is a really big deal for a country like Ukraine. And a lot of their medical supplies had been pilfered and sent east to the war, to the front. And so they told us they were within a day of running out of uh, like morphine and pain medicines and made and gauze and major supplies that they needed, but they didn't have these specialized sutures that they needed to use the very next morning for a transplant patient who was waiting because they had a donor. So we overnighted in the hospital. Um, this is my bed. At whatever time in the morning, we lights out and 4.30, we get woken up, air raid. And my job, of course, is to take pictures while shit goes down, if you will. So I'm trying to photograph everybody running into the basement of this hospital for this during this air raid alarm. And my colleagues kind of trying to figure out where the safest place is to go. And um, I frankly, I'm just like, oh my God, I want to sleep like they, they I, I they had a hard time getting me out of bed I guess but uh once we were down there we're trying to assess the situation and figure out how realistic this is what the attack you know how likely this is um obviously NGOs have to be careful about this kind of stuff so we're wandering around the basement trying to figure out what's going on um trying to see how safe it is what the structure looks like eventually um we figure out that everybody else is basically upstairs asleep. The doctors have just slept through these enough that they're sort of like, whatever. Um, and they're not paying a ton of attention to them at this point. Maybe they poke their heads out, but they're not coming running down into the basement with us. So 4.30, so we got in at like one, Dr. Igor, the man I told you about who met us with uh, cake and uh, Coca-Cola and coffee at one o'clock in the morning. He has a heart transplant the next morning, but he insists upon being hospitable. And then at four, we're up with the air raid alarm. And um, the next morning, uh, this, this is now 7 a.m. So I'm gonna actually um, play my little audio clip now. If I can. Oh, come on. So this is the second one. mute myself again. So that's the second one. And they're about, I don't know, three, four hours apart at that time. And I mean, boohoo for us, no big deal would, you know, it's a night of sleep, but the people, the doctors who are staying there who have to do these surgeries, it's really like incredible that they're overnighting in these hospitals, waking up for these air raid alarms. I learned later that the reason I showed this photo is I learned later that this water is actually a reservoir that they've got sitting there in case of attack that they can use it to put out fires. Um, and you know, we were, the reason I'm out there filming is I'm scanning the horizon trying to see if there's smoke anywhere, right? So I get to scrub in and go into a surgery. Just, um, I don't like to, you know, a little behind the scenes for you. So I get to scrub in, which is really cool. And I won't show you, there's gonna be one photo, none of these photos are gonna be bloody, but I'll tell you the one, the one there's one that might be a little bit. And I got to photograph a heart transplant, which was one of the, the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. I can't even describe it. Um, this is the donor whose family had uh, given permission to, you know, harvest the organs from this person who's brain dead, you know, from a, in a you know, an accident. And um, so these doctors who've been awake and all night, who've been on and off, you know, who don't have supplies, who are trying to do this medicine without, the, you know, without what they need are now trying to transplant a human heart. And um, Dr. Igor, fresh from his late night hosting us and uh, dodging air raid alarms is leading the team, harvesting the heart. And uh, <laughs> very kindly, I actually told him that um, 
I had had uh, a cardiac procedure. I had had an ablation, uh, which is a procedure for a rapid heartbeat. I told them I'd had this this procedure to fix a, a, a rapid heartbeat. And first thing, this is in surgery. I told him this. He puts his fingers on my wrist and he goes, checks my pulse. He goes, oh, it's fixed. Like this is his level of concern. <laughs> this is his level of concern. Uh, and so I'm photographing this heart transplant and I'm watching out in the distance behind the city of Lviv. And this is sort of the setting for this. And uh, Dr. Igor, when he gets a break, is going to the window and watching. You can maybe see just a little bit right here. There's some smoke in the distance and he's wondering if it's an attack. Um, he's trying to finish the surgery and, and make sure that there isn't a, a bombing in the meantime. So this is one of the cool, this is probably one of the coolest photos I've ever taken in my life, even though it's not that interesting visually. I couldn't believe it. Apparently when you take a heart out of a body, this is what you do. Um, you put it in a cooler. Pick up your cell phone. No text messages. And race across the hospital to the other wing where the recipient is waiting. So I got to race down the hallway with the heart and the transplant team and go watch them prepare the heart to be put into the recipient. And remember those little sutures I was telling you about? I finally got to see, apparently, these very special piece of medical equipment that got, we got to bring across the border. And the reason that that's important, that story is important is because one of the things we don't think about in these situations, I think we think a lot about what's happening on the front and we see images from what's being bombed, but what happens to the entire medical system, the amount of strain that gets passed along the chain because of lack of supply, because of the fatigue and healthcare workers. And it's not just medicine, it's every other aspect of civil society, but the, the, the total shutdown of civil society affects people at every level. It's not just the number of, okay, maybe X number of people were killed today in a bombing and that number sounds high to me or that number sounds low to me, but the ripple effect throughout really persists. And the strain always on healthcare systems is really, really high in these situations. So these guys managed to get their cardiac sutures. Uh, this is this incredible um, machine that basically keeps a person alive without a heart in them and moves the blood around the body the way that the heart would. And uh, Dr. Igor is finishing up uh, his, his work here where he put the heart into the new person and to the recipient and sewed them up. And um, this is a warning slide if you wanna close your eyes, the next slide uh, does depict a human heart, but it's not bloody. Uh, and this is where we end our story. Um, it's, it's really, it's just the gift of life. Uh, it's, it's, it's the, it's the little thing that, that we can do. Um, it's not, it maybe isn't very much in this case, it was a, a suitcase that got across a border. Um, but this person now has that heart inside them. And I heard that he uh, was taken off of breathing, uh, apparatus the next day. And what's more, apparently there were two kidneys harvested also that went to two kids. So that's, that's the piece that I got to see and contribute in this, this trip. So I'll just end with a little bit of uh, behind the scenes as we're getting out of the country. Um, getting out of Ukraine was interesting because we took the same path that the fleeing refugees took. So as we're fleeing the country, it's no easier for us to get out than it is for them. And I got to actually see for the first time firsthand what it's like to try to get out of a country um, that I often photograph people on the other side of. We had to walk down a very long, there's a sort of like a demilitarized zone, kind of a no man's land between Poland and Ukraine that it's a long about 700 meter place. And of course you're not allowed to photograph, but my job is to photograph. So a lot of my, um, a lot of my life looks like this, you know, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of this, you know, there's a lot of this kind of action with the phone um, because it's so important to get these images. Am I being a vulture? Am I, I'm breaking the law. Um, I'm, you know, I'm certainly putting myself at risk. I'm often putting other people at risk. Am I being a vulture? Is this worth it? Is this image worth it? Um, I took a few very short clips that are terrible, but these are just inside uh, the, 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 this is just from the chest filming like this, but this is just what it looks like when the refugees are leaving Ukraine as we're crossing the border with them to get back to Poland. 
and we're spending hours with people trying to get across the border. And uh, we eventually, of course, got across as, as did all the people that we were with, which was great. But um, in the end, I get to fall asleep in the car with my colleague. And the sad part is that they're still there. And when I come back, it's great. And it's really important I get to talk about it, but it's heartbreaking to, to leave the people behind that I met and not to know what they're doing and to leave my team behind. And um, luckily I'm gonna see these guys again pretty soon, I think, but um, them's the breaks. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, and uh, the really important piece at the end was of course, when I got back to Krakow, I had to get a tattoo to commemorate my experience this is something that's important to me. And I ended up getting this U Ukraine symbol and it turned out that my tattooer in Krakow was from Lviv. And so we had, the, he, his family was back there and he had this, uh, he was, he was happy to get, to give me the tattoo uh, from Lviv, but uh, he didn't know how his family was doing, unfortunately, which is sad. So I'll stop there. I'll be happy to take questions if people have them. Thanks. Thank you so much, James. And it's just a quick segue here before we get to questions. Um, thank you for the powerful stories that you shared with us with these images tonight. And to let you all know that um, if you're interested, we do have a sheet here in the back of the room. And also for our Zoom attendees, um, we will send tomorrow about resources if you wanna do more for Ukraine, different organizations that are available to help um, support the people there. And a reminder, if you're joining late, that we are recording um, this hybrid event in person as well as on Zoom. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to James um, and really encourage people uh, to ask a few questions. And uh, James is gonna be kind enough to kind of repeat those questions back uh, for our particular format tonight. Okay. So happy to answer any questions, please. Yeah. In response to what you mentioned at the beginning, uh, how odd it feels for you to be in this kind of position for the Soviet government as well. What I would say, when people ask me often what, why I make art work, and what I say is that it gives me the opportunity to, to send people with a window into another world that they otherwise would have not. And so I would argue that that's exactly what you're doing. So that's why it's so fitting that you are doing this presentation. In this case, it's literally a window into literally another world. <laughs> thanks for oh, thanks so much. Um, uh, to repeat that back, uh, the the, the comment was that um, I, I sort of started off by saying it's this, I felt strange sort of showing something here in, in like this in Burlington and in, in Burlington City Arts, but uh, another artist was saying that it's it's important to sort of see this window into another world and. Um, I agree, and that's my hope, right? It's it's so hard to walk that line between showing people something, uh, inviting people into their world, and then there's the then there's, then there's kind of gawking, and then there's the point at which we're sort of like um, objectifying something or sort of looking at it if this. Um, <sighs> It can be, it, it, it's hard, you know, what is that window into the other world? What does it depict and how, how are we looking through it? Are we, we have our nose pressed up against the glass. Are we opening the window and trying to communicate with the people? Are we listening to what they're saying to us? That's, um, it's a really good way of framing it, I think. And I, I'm, I'm, I am curious and I mean, I'm, I'm totally open to what people think about that because I think that um, we often see these images. I think that especially now you know, at one point, right? At one point in history, images from war were, uh, really shocking. And in the Vietnam War, right, we know that we didn't have a lot of images at one point. We started to see certain images and it started to change public opinion about the war. And other points in history, like Tiananmen Square, the tank man image really sort of showed people something that um, was important. But at this point in history, when we have so much social media, we have such saturation of images, is this type of photography still important? Is there a place for it? Or am I just sort of like uh, rubbing people's noses in something? You know, I, I, it's, it's difficult. Yes, uh, there's a question from someone in our Zoom audience. Uh, we have seen so much of the Ukrainian people in the United States and Russia 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 and
Ooh, that's a great question. So the question is, um, after seeing so much, is there anything at night that sort of flashes before my eyes from my many assignments? And, you know, you know, I feel guilty answering that question because I feel like there, there ought to be a right answer to that. You know, I ought to say maybe this one situation really haunts me or this one person um, I wish I could go back to. And I think the thing that I try to do, I feel guilty sometimes because I do put it away. I don't always successfully put it away. I often don't put it away. My partner knows I don't put it away. I come home and it's all around me and the images are in my head a lot. But when I am able to put it away, I can feel guilty. And sometimes I keep in, I do keep in touch with people. It's really important to me actually when I meet people and um, interview them and go through these sort of life events with them that I give people my number and stay in contact over WhatsApp. And some of the languages that I do speak, I can keep in touch with people a lot more. And but sometimes after time, that communication will fall off. And that's the thing that really haunts me. It's not so much, I'll, I'll give you a better answer to that also, but one of the things that haunts me really, I guess what I'm saying is that I can't do more. It haunts me that I, that I have a limit. I wish that I, every single person that I ever met and saw, and because in that moment when I'm interacting with somebody and I'm te they're telling me their story, right, they're pouring out everything that they've got for me and I'm writing it all down or I'm recording it, I'm, I'm taking it all in. But it's just a moment, you know, it's two people sort of passing and then that moment's gone and it's haunting to know how many times that's happened and I don't know what's happened to all those people and I wish somehow that I could keep track of them all and look them all up and I do that to the best of my ability but, um, but sometimes I don't and sometimes those connections do slip and it, it does haunt me but a, a more tangible answer I'll be brief is I think Haiti it was is one of the most difficult places I've ever been I was there um, for this most recent earthquake. And um, that's a, that haunts me that I didn't, that haunts me that I couldn't do more there. Um, there was a real lack of humanitarian aid there. There's a lack of coordination there. I could talk about that a lot. And when I was in Haiti, walking down the street, people would just yell at me, like in, and unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, I speak enough French to understand them. And they would be saying essentially like, hey, foreigner, what, how are you going to help me? My house fell down. My house is broken. Come over here. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And I'm, on my Instagram, there's actually a post from one day. I had gone through so many days of just hearing the words, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. That I just posted those words, like not even a photo, because I was so overwhelmed by hearing that all the time. Um, and yeah, those are sort of the breaking points that happen, I think. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Um, the, the, the comment was just that uh, seeing the seeing the sort of photos in a longer format as opposed to just maybe a shorter blurb in the news makes it more real. And um, I'm glad. I'm glad. I think that it is hard to sit down and consume an hour's worth of any kind of content at this point for anybody, for any of us. For me, it's hard. And I think, you know, I give the credit back to you, actually, because by coming, by watching, by spending whatever time we all spend thinking about other people's lives, reading about other people's lives, having a window into them, whatever energy we can give them, even if it's just psychic energy, it's so hard to get out of our own lives. We all have so much suffering. No one's life is truly easier than another person's or free from suffering in any case. And I think the amount of time and energy we devote to witnessing one another's lives is really magnificent, however we can do it. So really the credit goes to the viewer uh, who, who makes the time for, for someone else's story. So thank you. Yeah. What's 
So what's next for these photos and stories for me? You know, it's a good question. This is great. Being at Burlington City Arts is great. Um, I don't tend to promote myself or my work much. I don't think about it. I, But it's actually really goes back to that first question, what sort of haunts me. And I think it's frankly... I have to get I have to get past the idea that promoting the images or talking about them is sort of self-serving because really it's I mean it may be but um, what happens too often is that I go to these places I photograph these things I hear these stories and then it kind of ends I come back home and I'm like I, I it's a dead end for me it's really difficult emotionally it's difficult for me because I can't connect to people around me because I'm trying to I've got these stories in my head that like, and we all know this is true of people who go in, who deal with conflict and other kinds of situations and PTSD is really common. That's an issue that I've dealt with also. So for me, it's kind of like this wall where I come home and I just have all these emotions and experiences and I can't do anything with them. And I feel frustrated. I can't connect to people. Um, so that's a good psych up speech for myself to try to do more of this type of work because it always just feels like sort of self-serving for me. And I come back and I'm like, who wants to see my photos from this place? I just went like, oh God, just, it's not about you, James, you know, but um, I'm hearing more that it's useful. So I don't know what's next, but maybe you guys have some ideas. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So the question is um, about refugees wanting to go home and whether they're wanting more uh, weapons poured into Ukraine and that kind of support or settlement and peace. And I was sort of hoping to avoid those kinds of questions because I, I, I'll tell you this, this is a cheat for me, but I indulge often when I'm working a humanitarian assignment and not following the the politics of it super closely because I don't know why I don't know why exactly but for me I try to when I, I try to keep those two missions very separate when I'm really politically engaged with an issue it makes it harder to do the human I get what happened for me is I get really polarized around how I feel about it and that will that those emotions will will come into the the situation how I'm photographing people I'll get more it's usually I'll probably be more upset with the authority figures or whoever I think is the bully or the bad guy in this situation and I can be more reactive and less compassionate. So I try as much as I can to avoid thinking about that stuff, uh, which I realize is indulgent and it is a little bit, it is indulgent. Um, I don't know that people told, but I'll try to answer though. I don't know that people gave me a lot of this is a funny one because I'm thinking about it now. It actually, there was sort of an absence of this. A lot of times people will very talk very heatedly about the politics and, you know, I mean, obviously, the, I think the politics on this one are pretty clear. So I don't think, um, I'm sorry that I, I wish I had a better answer to this question. People didn't tell me a lot about that kind of stuff. People said they want to go home and they want they want um, they want the fighting to stop. I think that's the best case scenario. How exactly that comes about, I don't know. But the people I were I was I mean, there were other people going the other way. I'll tell you very briefly. I met one American who was, and I, I know of many more who were going over there trying to fight because there are people wanting to sign up for the Ukrainian military and to to fight and and, and to do that thing. But the people I saw were coming the other way. They're going away from the fighting and they're trying to find somewhere safe, um, and. I don't know what they want as an end to this. I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hmm. Sure. The question is, when I'm deployed for an assignment like this, what is Project Hope's expectation of me? And in this case, um, I've worked with Project Hope for a number of years now, so we kind of, they kind of, we kind of know, we they sort of know me and they sort of know what I can do. Um, it's, <laughs> the expectation is sort of like, like photography is kind of this magical thing, you know, I think people, you see, we see photos, we consume photos, but like, we all take photos, but think about how hard it is to get your, you know, two-year-old, you know, nephew to pose for one minute or, you know, when you maybe see a police officer doing something or just, you know, 
the, the difficult photography. I think there's sort of this, this beautiful magic of seeing images that we like. And so um, Project Hope, <laughs> the expectation is that I'll go there and make it happen, um, which I sort of know how to do at this point, but it's, it's a lot of logistics. But general, I think more specifically, it's, it's that I typically, in this case, humanitarian organizations are on the ground in places where news organizations aren't. So I'm able to deploy with them and get access to footage that they can send to news outlets. So in this case, yeah. Yeah, so they use it for fundraising and stuff like that, direct relief, but also in this case, it's really important. So when there's a global emergency, it's really important because news outlets aren't there yet. And so I'm able to go where they can't because I'm with emergency responders. And so my footage got sent out to CNN, CBS, whatever, because, so I'm able to kind of help contribute to the story. I think MSNBC now is going back to follow my trail um, back through this reporting that I did for Project Hope and uh, reported out for MSNBC. So hopefully I can kind of like uh, create some little pathways for, for journalists to, to follow. Mm. Does that help? Yeah, well, that's good. That's helpful. <laughs> yeah, no, as, as, does that help us with my my feeling of the the the, the being a vulture? So I, I, yes, maybe, hopefully. I guess that's a, that's. I hope so. I hope so. That's that's always the the hope. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that kind of colleague. So the question is, do I share photos with my colleagues? It seems like it would help uh, them feel the human impact of their work. And by colleagues, I assumed you meant the people at the humanitarian organization, because you maybe mean photojournalists, but photographers are sort of lone creatures. You know, you might see a bunch of us together where there's a big event of some kind, but typically we're sort of off on our own. And it's a bit difficult, actually, because I don't have colleagues. Like, I, I'm, I envy people that work in an office sometimes because you got people to talk to and bounce ideas off of it. I'm the only one doing what I do on my team most of the time. So um, I wish that I shared more with photojournalists. And, you know, I would love that. I, I don't know why photojournalists don't get together and share images. Maybe they'll do it without me. I don't know. But I wish we would talk about this stuff more. You know? <laughs> I wish we would talk about this stuff more, but um, the people I do share it with are the colleagues that do the humanitarian work. And I really, it's really important for me to encourage them by showing them images of the work they're doing and the, 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 the good that they're creating because it, keeping their morale up, showing them, I will reflect to them often. Like I will message them specifically. This is this person. I met so-and-so in the field. This person received the aid that you sent from DC that you routed, da, 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 da. Here's the story and I'll send it home to DC so that people can feel connected and want to keep doing their work. Yeah. And it's just a clarification. Sure. Ah. Uh, yes. With with those people, absolutely. I try to. I think that's one of the great things I get to do is I'm sort of like a ground truther. You know, a lot of times people who at an NGO, the, the emergency response team get to go out in the field, but most people at an NGO work at an office and they never meet any of the beneficiaries that they are helping, and they spend their whole lives trying to help these people. And they don't make great salaries, you know. And I get to go to these places where they are, they've sent these, whatever they've sent, and I get to tell these stories and I'll message people back in DC or wherever they are in the world and say, this is this person you helped. And I hope that it encourages them to keep going. Yeah. This is a comment and question. Um, seeing your presentation of this work was very palpable, the distress and, and guilt that it brings you mm. to making this work, which is not something that we often think of. We mm. Well, so this is a great question, and I, I'll share this. That's a really good place to sort of end. I was actually hoping to talk about this just a little bit. The question is uh, how uh, apparently I'm displaying a lot of angst and guilt um, about my photography. <laughs> I was it was was remarked upon. Uh, good to know. And how do I cope with all this stuff? And um, it, this is actually the most important piece of the work. I used to think the most important piece of the work was sort of this uh, heroic um, 
self-righteous, I'm going to mess up the bad guys and take images of all the bad things in the world and fight the power kind of thing. And that's how I got arrested in Egypt. And it did very little good for anybody. What I've come to realize is that actually, as in many helping fields, self-care is actually the most important thing. And while that sounds really hokey, um, I'm in recovery and uh, I have been for about two years, which is really important to me. And that's been a real turning point in my career when I got past the point where my work was sort of overwhelming me and I was like knocked back by it all the time and I was struggling to keep going and working in recovery and in the different ways I address PTSD and work with my mental health challenges, I am able to kind of keep going and I have a really strong network um, of people in recovery and um, some of the other vultures that I now have in my phone, a network of people I can call my sponsor, different people anytime, my partner's a great help. That's what I try to do. I have to remind myself, you, have, you can't pour from an empty vessel. You have, to keep, you have to keep filling yourself up. So some of the things I did at the end of my trip um, were go to a church service in, um, uh, I think it was Catholic. I have no idea. I have no religion in my life of particular, but going to a church service in um, Polish was really helpful for me. Um, and getting just the songs, the sort of emotion, the, the feeling of it, because this is, this, is a, this is where I am at the end of the trip. Um, this is where I am. It's not a good place. And what helps me also is getting videos from home. Uh, my partner sends me videos of like, look, there's birds in the tree and I have to remember things like beyond war, beyond refugees, beyond there are birds. Like there, it's okay to be happy some of the time. It is okay to be happy some of the time. It's okay to put the burden down some of the time and to go get a tattoo or whatever it is you need to do. And uh, on that note, um, I came home with a respiratory infection and scabies. And <laughs> so uh, this is a big, but this is a big, but I, do, I get to deal with those things within a medical system where I have access to care in a home that has a roof, in a place where I'm able to wash my bedding every day. And the people that are... <laughs> And that's a big deal when you have scabies, if you don't know. And people who are migrants, populations that I work with often don't have those access to those guys, which make your scabies go away. So self-care, physical, mental, spiritual, is really, really important for anybody doing this kind of work. So thanks for asking. Hmm. Well, I'm getting a lot of support from this this group tonight. I'm really glad I came here. <laughs> the, the the comment was that uh, that um, the, the, another way for thinking about being a witness is being a, a messenger, and that it's, if I'm going to invest all this time and effort into sort of going collecting this message, that it's important to get it out to as wide an audience as possible. And I think that's a really good point. So uh, I appreciate that we voted tonight in favor of um, that. It's okay for me. <laughs> to show this work and that I'm not, you know, essentially just a vulture, but I, I appreciate that from, I'll put those in my plus one column. So thank you all. <laughs> yeah. Please, please. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. So the, the, I'm being advised that my, stealthy mess to the of filming with the camera with the blue case is a bad um yeah so maybe i'll try to like i'll try to find a better method for next time but and if i get arrested i expect you guys will uh you know retweet my pleas for help from wherever i am so thank you all very much <laughs>